Okay, we're going to take a look at my latest purchase, Nations in Arms. And I missed this one in 2012. It was published by Compass Games, and the designer was Francis Stanislaw Thomas. Now, when the game first came out, it got a lot of um, negative publicity concerning the rule book. There were a lot of questions about the way the booklet was written. And over the next few years, some fans got together and sort of redid the rules, which is a good thing. So Compass Games reprinted the rule book and the playbook in 2019. And this is the edition that I have. So I can't comment on the original edition. I never really saw it. It's my understanding it's the same game, only the rules have been fixed up with errata, illustrations, etc. The components are all the same. So let's take a look at this uh, gigantic game on the Napoleonic Wars. Okay, one of the uh, good, bad things about the game are the maps. The maps are beautiful. There are two of them, but they are physically very, very large. And you put them together if you want to play out the whole campaign. Now I've got an IKEA table here that when extended is seven foot three inches long. That won't help you when you go to play this game. Because as you can see, it just doesn't fit on the tables. And that's a huge negative for me, which pretty well precludes me ever playing the campaign game of this. Not that I would be playing it anyway. I think a campaign game would probably take close to 50 to 100 hours. But uh, let me show you how I got around this problem for me. Now one of the things I like about this game is there's a scenario that I've longed to try out for a long time and that's the uh, 1792 scenario. scenario. They call it La Patrie en Danger which is the country in danger. Now we have to remember that in 1792 Napoleon is only a major of his regiment. He was actually absent from that regiment for quite a while. So he has yet to make his name on the world stage. And this is one of the reasons why I like this scenario. Now I got around the map problem by just backfolding the top of the map on the left and the top on the right. Because for this scenario, you're only going to be using as far south as Gibraltar here and in the north around Holland. So the bulk of that scenario takes place in here with parts of Italy. So you can play scenarios on this game, but you'll have to do some ingenious backfolding of the map to get it all in. Now, if you do that, some of the army boxes may not be available to you, so what I'm going to do is make some copies of those, and maybe some of the tables will not be on. So there are workarounds, but. Um, I wish the designers, when they're making their games, would make their games with a view to the fact that we have to fit these games on our tables. But that aside, this is a, a very good game and a very good in-depth game. Now I've owned at one time just about every large-scale Napoleonic game out there on the market. My current favorites right now are the Napoleonic Wars by Mark McLaughlin, and more recently, I've got Andrew Rowland's Napoleon's Imperium. But I've yet to play Napoleon's Imperium because it's so large. It really needs to be played multiplayer, up to seven players. So we're going to concentrate in this video on nations in arms, and uh, we'll take a look at the uh, board and the pieces and tell you a little bit about this fascinating game. Okay, now this is a monster game in every sense of the word. If you see my video on uh, Mark McLaughlin's War and Peace, uh, you'll see some of the problems I had with sorting that game. This game is really no different. I tried trays, one tray with bags. I tried sorting them by generals, by core, everything. And in the end, I had to succumb to plain baggies and by nationality. It's the only way you're going to get all these pieces in that box. 
Now, since I like the 1792 scenario especially, what I did was take out the counters just for that scenario. Now, that may be the answer to setting up other scenarios. I don't know. I know if you try to set up, let's say, Austerlitz, um, you're going to have to use troops that were in the 1792 scenario so that there's no real quick and easy way of setting up this game. God knows what the campaign game must be like. I have no idea. I would approximate, oh, I don't know, 50 to 100 hours to play it. It is a big game in every sense of the word. Now the game comes with, I think, 150 event cards, but this is not a card-driven game. Um, you can, you do sort them by year, so there's a little bit of scripting, but I'm fine with that. The cards are colorful, they're detailed, and they add a lot of flavor to the game. So there's 150 or so of those. You also get reminiscent of the old 1776 Pavlon Hill, you do get this tactical deck, which if you have one card in your hand, will give you some advantage in combat. And there's conditions for those, the use of those tactical cards. Okay, here are some typical French counters. On the left here we have General Juno. The first number is his activation number. Zero you can ignore on the front and one is his combat modifier. When you flip Juno on the back it shows you his movement allowance when he's moving alone. Typical infantry counter, a bonus, one. That's his movement. Oh, the middle figure on the infantry corps represents its artillery value, how many guns it's bringing with it. Each of these counters more or less has two steps too. Now, cavalry is more or less the same information as infantry, except it's got this little wee kind of X symbol there. It means it's cavalry. These are detachment counters when you want to detach units to garrison places. There's a depot counter. Flip side is the artillery, or rather the train. And there's a typical fleet counter. Looks just like the land leaders, except there's a little anchor here to show that they are naval leaders. I won't show any other counters. All other nationalities are the same. Turks in green, Prussians in black, British, of course, in red. So that's the counters. They're a little on the thin side, but uh, they are certainly functional. Now, one of the advantages of a large map, of course, is the detail. You get a very, very nice rendition of of the terrain. You've got, uh, you know, fortifications here. You've got ports. The mountains are rendered fairly well. You've got mountain passes. And way over in the distance there, you've got the vastness of Russia and the Black Sea. It's just a nice map. Plus, you've got charts all along the edge of the map, too. I think that's one of the reasons why it takes so much space. It might have been a good idea to have those charts as separate um, cards. I don't know. That was a des uh, design decision, I guess, from Compass. But it's a very nice addition uh, of this game, for sure. You do get two manuals in the game, the rules of play, second printing, 2019. And uh, we're talking here about 50 pages of actual rules. They are illustrated in color. It's a very well done booklet. It does not have the shiny paper, which I like. I like being able to make copies and work from those. You do get a illustrated playbook also, which gives you all the scenarios. And there's even a little wee mini game, which uses just a portion of the map. The Marengo uh, campaign. One little uh, mini concern that I have about this game is that there's um, not much traffic about the game on ConSim or Board Game Geek. Could be that it was not a great seller, I don't know, although I'm pretty sure it's sold out. I think you'd be hard pressed to even get the second edition. I was lucky to get this when the mint unpunched, but um, I believe it's now out of print. 
Now the designer himself did a third game, which is called Napoleon in Europe. So either he was rethinking this whole game, Nation in Arms, and he redid it, making the map smaller and a bit more playable. So maybe he learned something from these large maps, I don't know. He had done a previous edition way back in, what, 2007 or so? Anyway, he called that game um, Le Grand Empire or something. Anyway, so the author has taken this subject three times now. And so this is his second stab at the project. I did own Napoleon in against Europe at one time. And I don't know, I just, I couldn't get into it for some reason. So that's why I bought this one, even though it's an older game. And I knew of the bad press about the first edition. That didn't bother me because the second edition seems just fine. So I really can't tell you much about how it plays. I really don't know. Now I'm going to attempt the uh, scenario that I like, the 1792 scenario. And uh, I'm interested in that one because it stems from the term Napoleonic Wars. We all call them the Napoleonic Wars. I mean, that's what all historians call them. But if you start studying Napoleon, you'll find that in literature and in games, um, a lot of games start very late. For example, Mark McLaughlin's Napoleonic Wars starts in 1805. And um, well, that's when Napoleon became emperor. But I'm interested in all of the wars against France. And those wars were really grouped together and called the Wars of the Coalition because there were seven different coalitions against Napoleon. And again, as I mentioned before, Napoleon in 1792 is, is a major. He's really a nobody. And uh, it wouldn't be correct to call them Napoleonic Wars for 1792. But um, that's the, the scenario I want to explore, the War of the First Coalition. To my knowledge, there's no game out there on it. I think Victory Games did do a game called the Campaign of Valmy, but that only concerns that campaign, not the whole war as a whole. Now this game deserves a lot more attention than I'm going to be giving to it in this video. It's just a short introduction, see if you can get some interest in it. But um, I don't know, I, I kind of like the look of this one. But for me, the best game on the Napoleonic Wars still for me is Mark McLaughlin's Napoleonic Wars. Now Mark's game has got a very good reputation in the gaming hobby. It's been a uh, tournament favorite at WBC for years. It's been out of print for a long time. And this second edition is 2008. Still out of print and it's too bad because this is one fine game. Now your purists would say that well this isn't really a simulation of the Napoleonic Wars but I don't know, I, I would argue with that. This one probably is going to be the better simulation, but whether it's a better game or not, I don't know. Now, any designer that takes on the subject of covering the entire Napoleonic Wars is taking on a big subject indeed. Um, each designer has handled it in a little bit different way, and uh, kudos to them for trying because it's a big task. Perhaps one game really can't cover the Napoleonic Wars in total. It's just too complex a situation. It's too fluid. Countries changing sides, military reforms in between. It's a big subject. So I'm not too critical of any of the Napoleonic titles. They've all been pretty good. But this is my sort of new kid on the block for me. I'm going to explore it, see what I can do with it. But I'll always return to the Napoleonic Wars because uh, I think it's one fine game. So, sorry if this video is not all that you expected it to be. Like I said, Nation in Arms, or Nations in Arms, deserves a, a full treatment. Now, there have been some people who have done some pretty good videos on the playing of it, and I recommend you give them a try. It's, um, if you get your hands on it, you may like it. Certainly if you're into Napoleon, it's probably a game you want to have in your canon of games. Thank you for watching.